to share with you something my wife and I discovered while we were serving in Central America. In fact, it's from Guatemala, and it's called a huipil. This is a traditional fabric, traditional clothing that the Indians in Guatemala wear. And what's very interesting, it's hand-woven. It's something that's very valuable to them because it takes time and effort to make. In fact, each one of the huipils in Guatemala come from a unique region. The ones you see in the images are from the village of St. Mark. And everyone in that village wears the same huipil, the same color, the same fabric, the same style. It's what identifies them. Well, it's part of a rich and a beautiful culture. And they're happy because it represents their heritage, their culture. What about you and I? If you could choose a piece of clothing that identified you, what would it be? Would it be a suit, a dress, your favorite pair of jeans? Well, the truth is that we don't have a clothing, a piece of clothing that identifies us. But the Bible does compare our Christian identity to clothing. We like to look in the Bible and examine where the Bible encourages us to compare that, our identity to clothing. Colossians chapter 3, verses 9 through 14. Please turn with me there in your Bible. I remember that as Christians we have this identity, this culture. It's not something we're born into, but rather it's something that we adopt and it visibly identifies us. Notice in Colossians chapter 3, there in verse 9, they make reference to it saying we should strip off the old personality, stripping off that old clothing, if you will. And notice verse 10, chapter 3, verse 10, and clothe yourselves with the new personality, which through accurate knowledge is being made new according to the image of the one who created it. Then in verse 12 again, the Apostle Paul said, Accordingly as God's chosen ones, holy and loved, clothe yourselves with tender affections of compassion, kindness, humility, mildness, and patience. Continue putting up with one another and forgiving one another freely, even if anyone has a cause for complaint against another. Just as Jehovah freely forgave you, you must also do the same. But besides all these things, clothe yourselves with love, for it is a perfect bond of union. So we can see that the, here the Christian personality is likened to clothing. Again, it's something visible for all to see. And everyone here has worked very, very hard to put on the Christian personality, to put on that Christian identity. It's what makes you beautiful. It's what makes you beautiful not only in my eyes, but in Jehovah's eyes. Yes, we've put in a lot of effort and time in developing these qualities of kindness, compassion, humility, patience, and love. You're to be commended. But can this Christian identity, our Christian identity, be removed? Can it be lost? Notice what Revelation chapter 16 and verse 15 says. Revelation chapter 16 and verse 15. And there we find the answer. Here in Revelation 16, there's a vision. And in verse number 15, Jesus Christ, the glorified Jesus Christ, is speaking. There he says, Revelation chapter 16 and verse 15, Look, I am coming as a thief. Happy is the one who stays awake and keeps his outer garments, so that he may not walk naked, and people look upon his shamefulness. Notice here Jesus refers to the outer garments. What are these outer garments? They refer to our righteous identity as a Christian. It's the Christian qualities that we just mentioned in Colossians, and also the principles and morals that guide us in our service to Jehovah God. And this Christian identity allows us to have a close and intimate relationship with our Father, Jehovah. But you notice, these outer garments can be removed, because we're told to keep on holding on to them. Otherwise, we can walk around naked, if you will. In what sense? Well, if we were to lose our outer garments and become naked, we would lose our precious relationship with Jehovah God. Yes, we can lose our Christian identity. But how does this happen? 
What's interesting, no human can force us to remove our outer garments. Yes, no human, no government, no law, no prison, no unbelieving mate, no family member, not even Satan the devil and his powerful wicked forces can force us to remove our Christian identity. So how is it possible then that we can lose it, we can remove it as the scripture says? Well, sadly, some have willingly removed their Christian identity. Willingly, they have given up their identity as Christians and sadly have lost their relationship with Jehovah God. Well, how can this happen? Well, let's illustrate it by, by means of a parable. Uh, this parable is that of the sun and the wind. And one day, the sun and the wind were arguing over who was greatest, who was more powerful. So as they were arguing, a, a young man was walking by, by them, and this man had a heavy coat on, heavy winter coat. So they decided whoever could remove the coat first was the strongest. So the wind began to blow with a cold wind, a strong wind, but the stronger he blew, with more force, the man just held on to his jacket even tighter and tighter. He refused to let go of his jacket. Well, after some time, the sun said, it's my turn. And little by little, the sun began to shine brighter and brighter and brighter. And as the temperature began to rise, the man unbuttoned his jacket one button at a time, eventually opening it up. And as it became hot, well, he removed his jacket completely left it on the side of the road and continued on his way. Well, what's the lesson of this small parable? We can really see how it illustrates well that Satan's attack against us. He uses both direct attacks and subtle. But in both cases, neither the sun nor the wind was able to remove the jacket. Who removed it? The man did. He removed it himself. Now sometimes, as we say, Satan's attacks can be very direct. We think of uh, how he gives persecution, such as banning us from attending meetings, or banning our work in the preaching activity, or banning our literature. But is this direct attack always successful? Actually, it's not. Many times when Jehovah's people are banned, they realize how much they value their worship to Jehovah. And so what's happening in, for example, in Russia, we can see it's not effective as much as Satan would like it to be because the brothers really rally around each other. They appreciate their Bible reading, even more so their personal study, their Christian meetings. So Satan uses other attacks, which are much more subtle. Again, if your boss told you, you cannot attend the meeting this Sunday, you cannot read your Bible, you cannot preach, would you listen to him? Probably not. But if he told you you had to do overtime this weekend, or rather in your school, uh, your teacher told you you had a special project that had to be finished, or they encouraged you to work uh, in extracurricular activities at school, maybe uh, sports or special projects that would allow, wouldn't allow you to attend the meetings regularly, or would impede your personal Bible reading and personal study. Or what about discouragement? because of financial problems, or discouragement because of health problems. We see these are those subtle methods that Satan uses, and they can be effective in causing ones to slowly remove their outer garments, remove their Christian identity. And here we really have a, an attack that is subtle, isn't it? Uh, I remember one time speaking to a brother when I was a young man in Bethel. I didn't know at the time, but he was the branch coordinator of a branch that was in Eastern Europe and had severe persecution. And when I came to find out the, where he served and the persecution they were facing, I told the brother, you know, we pray for those brothers there. And he said, you know what? The brothers where we are are praying for you here in the United States. I was a bit surprised because we have the freedom to preach. We have the freedom to attend meetings, to read the Bible, all of our publications. But he said the reason was because where they are, the enemy is clearly identified. It's the police, it's the governments that are banning the work, that are entering into the, to the kingdom halls and removing our brothers, arresting them. But for us here in the States, sometimes it's more difficult to identify the enemy, to realize who it is. 
And so those subtle attacks, as we mentioned, can be very effective here where we are in the United States. So we must be prepared. We must safeguard our Christian identity. Now Satan realizes that he cannot remove our Christian identity. So he tries to trick us, confuse our thinking, cause us to remove our, or abandon our Christian identity. Now one of those tools that we we can identify is in James chapter 1. Let's, let's examine one of Satan's most effective tools. James chapter 1 and verses 6 through 8. That's James chapter 1. Notice there in verse 6, he says, But let him keep asking in faith, not doubting at all, for the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea, driven by the wind and blown about. In fact, the, that man should not expect to receive anything from Jehovah. He is an indecisive man, unsteady in all his ways. But you notice the tool that Satan uses to confuse us, to change our thinking. Ultimately, it is doubt. And Satan the devil has been spreading doubt for many, many years. In the Garden of Eden, he tried to create doubts when he spoke to Eve and he asked her, did God really say that you must not eat from every tree? Later on, when Jesus Christ, after his baptized, baptism was being challenged by Satan the devil, do you remember he said, if you are a son of God, tell these stones to become loaves of bread? Yes, Satan is a master at creating doubt. Well, Satan continues to use the same method today. The use of the media, the internet, apostates, our workmates, our classmates who do not share our Christian identity, a tinge of doubt can be planted in our heart. We can begin to doubt Jehovah himself, his word, his organization, and those doubts can begin to linger in our heart. Sadly again, this slowly can cause us to remove our outer garments. Yes, many have left the organization or Jehovah because they've had doubts that lingered and caused them to remove their Christian identity. Ultimately, they've lost their relationship with Jehovah because of it. But you notice the end result of doubt. The scripture there in verse uh, 6 says that the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea driven by the wind. It, they ultimately, as verse 8 says, become indecisive, unsteady in all of their ways. So, the end result is that your life has no direction. It lacks purpose. Isn't it true of those that leave Jehovah and leave his organization, oftentimes they're just tossed here and there, hither and thither, they lack direction or purpose in their life, and their life becomes just the pursuit of pleasure. A selfish life, without meaning and without fulfillment. Well, how can we, today, safeguard or protect our Christian identity? Well, remember, the opposite of doubt is faith, confidence, and trust. So we can protect our Christian identity by strengthening our relationship with Jehovah God, our confidence in His Word, and our trust in His organization. So, let's discuss two ways that we can do this specifically. The first we, we find in Psalm 26 and verse 2. So I invite you to turn with me in your Bibles to Psalm chapter 26, or Psalm 26. And verse 2. Notice here, this is a psalm of David. So there David says in verse 2, Examine me, O Jehovah, and put me to the test. Refine my innermost thoughts and my heart. You notice in prayer, David here was asking for Jehovah to do something very, very special. We sometimes are encouraged to do self-examinations, isn't it true? to look through our point of view, examine our life, perhaps our goals, our desires. But what David was asking here was something much more than a self-examination. He was asking Jehovah God to examine him. Jehovah could see his most intimate desires, 
his deepest fears. He could see his thoughts, his feelings. He understood who David was inside. So to ask Jehovah to examine him, to put him to the test, well, that was a serious thing. It required humility. It required faith. Why? Because was David completely clean? Did he have nothing to fear if Jehovah examined him? Well, David, like all of us, was imperfect. In fact, the scriptures say that he, we know he committed serious wrongdoings during his life. But he was willing to humbly ask Jehovah to examine him, and then to accept the reproof that Jehovah gave him, the loving counsel and correction that he received, so that he could have his thinking in harmony with Jehovah God's. So, what of us today? Brothers, are we willing, are we humble enough to ask Jehovah God to examine us, to put us to the test? Again, humility and faith are needed. Jehovah may allow certain situations to develop that could reveal our doubts, our weaknesses, or even wrong thinking. Example, young ones in school, you may find pressure to watch pornography. You may be in situations where you are tempted to commit immorality or to use drugs. Well, us older ones, uh, we may be tempted at work to be dishonest, unfaithful to our mates. But what about our neutrality in political affairs? Well, that's another situation that may develop. And Jehovah may allow such situations to develop. But when we face such tests, Will we react in such a way that identifies us as true Christians? Well, don't run away from tests, such tests. No, don't run away from them. Why? Notice verse 1, Psalm 26, verse 1. David said, Judge me, O Jehovah, for I have walked in my integrity. In Jehovah I have trusted without wavering. You notice the results. The results that David received from allowing Jehovah to examine him, to put him to the test, he was able to be an integrity keeper. Yes, he was able to have a trust that did not waver. If we allow Jehovah to examine us and put us to the test, and then we correct our wrong thinking as Jehovah does reveal it to us, well then we will have a trust without wavering. We will not lose our Christian identity. What is the second way? Notice the second way that we can protect our Christian identity or safeguard it. We find it in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 21. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 21. <coughs> Notice here in the letter to the congregation there in Thessalonica, chapter 5 and verse 21, the council here is given. It says, make sure of all things. Hold fast to what is fine. Make sure of all things. So how can we make sure of all things? Well, it's by being a student of God's Word. Remember, our Christian identity is not inherited. Rather, it is cultivated. Yes, we cultivate our Christian identity by studying God's Word regularly. Those precious qualities that we mentioned in Colossians, faith, mildness, love, Compassion, those are qualities that are cultivated by reading and studying God's Word daily. Through a deep personal study and an application, we can, as the scripture said, make sure of all things. This is very important for our young ones. We know that uh, as young ones, you're not born into a Christian identity. You must put forth the work, if you will, the effort that's involved in regularly studying God's Word, having a personal program to read and study the Bible. We have uh, electronic devices which are uh, a wonderful tool and most of us here use them. But we have to be careful not to make our study and preparation for the meeting superficial. It's so easy now to open up the watchtower, to click the scripture, to read it and to continue right on. But the danger is that our study becomes very superficial. We're just really reading the watchtower. It's important to give time to meditate on it, to do research on points we don't understand, or so we can deepen our appreciation for the wonderful privilege we have of serving Jehovah God, his precious and beautiful qualities 
and then we can apply that in our life. So by doing so, we're able to hold fast, continue to make sure of all things, and hold fast to what is fine, and protect or safeguard who we are, our Christian identity. I'd like to share with you something my wife and I discovered while we were serving in Central America. In fact, it's from Guatemala, and it's called a huipil. This is a traditional fabric, traditional clothing that the Indians in Guatemala wear. And what's very interesting, it's hand-woven. It's something that's very valuable to them because it takes time and effort to make. In fact, each one of the huipils in Guatemala come from a unique region. The ones you see in the images are from the village of St. Mark. And everyone in that village wears the same rupil, the same color, the same fabric, the same style. It's what identifies them. Well, it's part of a rich and a beautiful culture. And they're happy because it represents their heritage, their culture. What about you and I? If you could choose a piece of clothing that identifies you, what would it be? Would it be a suit, a dress, your favorite pair of jeans? Well, the truth is that we don't have a clothing, a piece of clothing that identifies us, but the Bible does compare our Christian identity to clothing. We like to look in the Bible and examine where the Bible encourages us to compare that, our identity to clothing. Colossians chapter 3, verses 9 through 14. Please turn with me there in your Bible. I remember that as Christians we have this identity, this culture. It's not something we're born into, but rather it's something that we adopt, and it visibly identifies us. Notice in Colossians chapter 3, there in verse 9, they make reference to it, saying we should strip off the old personality, stripping off that old clothing, if you will. And notice verse 10, chapter 3, verse 10, and clothe yourselves with the new personality which through accurate knowledge is being made new according to the image of the one who created it. Then in verse 12 again, the Apostle Paul said, Accordingly as God's chosen ones, holy and loved, clothe yourselves with tender affections of compassion, kindness, humility, mildness, and patience. Continue putting up with one another and forgiving one another freely, even if anyone has a cause for complaint against another. Just as Jehovah freely forgave you, you must also do the same. But besides all these things, clothe yourselves with love, for it is a perfect bond of union. So we can see that the, here the Christian personality is likened to clothing. Again, it's something visible for all to see.